Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait a few minutes before we start. Okay, so we are going to begin. Hi everyone again, and welcome to the Nuclear Ban Treaty, a Game Changer for Female Participation webinar. Uh, welcome also to our two incredible speakers, Maritza Chan and Alicia Sanders-Sakri, who will be officially introduced later on. So this webinar, it's the first thematic webinar as part of our broader feminist leadership in disarmament project, which includes webinar series along with research, opinion and blog posts and a social media campaign. The objectives of this webinar are to raise awareness on the achievements and contributions of women working in the field with the focus of women from the global south. We also aim to explore the challenges that women face as they enter and progress in the field of disarmament. For this particular webinar, we aim to discuss measures and ways on how the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons could help attain a more effective participation of women in nuclear disarmament, and also to examine the role of civil society initiatives shoring up female participation after the Treaty has entered into force. We hope that this webinar will challenge the dominant gendered narrative and examine ways in which the treaty indicates a strong support for practical change. So first, Scrap Weapons is a campaign that suggests adopting international legal agreements as the basis for general and complete global disarmament. At SCRAP, we are constantly developing research projects about disarmament, verification, emerging technologies, and of course, feminism in the field. And we hope to mobilize governmental, non-governmental, economic, expert forces in support of the same outcome. So briefly, my name is Marla, and I'm a member of the research team at SCRAP Weapons, along with my colleague Yanis. And today, together, we will be moderating this webinar. Thank you so much, Marla. Um, I want to give a brief overview, very brief overview um, about the uh, thematic objectives of this um, webinar and um, would just like to start with the treaty itself, with the TPNW. Just a quick recap. I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with the treaty, but um, we just want to make sure that we are on the, on the same page with that. So the treaty on the provisions of nuclear weapons is really a comprehensive um, nuclear weapons ban. It's been developed since 2010 and initiated through the disappointment 
um, of non-nuclear weapon states that nuclear weapon states would not fulfill the provisions under Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, that um, provision states that um, nuclear weapon states are obliged to pursue negotiations in good faith um, on effective measures relating to nuclear disarmament. And um, the humanitarian turn um, is the object or is, is, is um, what can basically be described as the beginning um, of this whole process leading to the ban treaty. Um, the humanitarian term began in 2010 and um, led to the um, negotiations and adoption um, of the ban treaty in 2017. Um, the ban treaty prohibits, and I quote, to develop, test, produce, manufacture, otherwise acquire, possess, or stockpile nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices, and it also includes um, IEA safeguards and verification measures. After reaching 50 ratifications, the ban entered into force at the 22nd of January, 2021. Um, why could the TPNW be feminist? I just wanna um, give two very brief reasons. Um, Ray Atchison, one of our speakers of the first webinar, um, stated in one of her papers that um, firstly, it shifts a discourse from deterrence to disarmament, from patriarchy to feminist and human-centered security. And second, um, the ban was achieved through the empowerment of women diplomats and activists from the global south. Our webinar aims to explore, really explore these um, uh, both elements, um, the discourses and the participation. Um, that's why we invited um, a perspective from diplomacy Maritza Chan, and a perspective from civil society, Alicia Senes Sacre. To make sure that you're all familiar with Zoom, um, we invite you to put your questions in the Q&A down here. And um, please make sure to add which speaker um, your question then is directed to. And we will have the Q&A um, after our speakers had a brief talk. Great, thank you, Yanis. So now I shall introduce our first speaker, which is Maritza Chan. Maritza Chan is an ambassador, deputy permanent representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations. She is an expert in peace and international security matters. She served before at the permanent mission of Costa Rica to the United Nations in New York. During her tenure at the United Nations, Ms. Chan was Costa Rica's arms trade treaty led negotiator. She has also served at the permanent mission of Costa Rica to the Organization of American States in Washington, DC, and at the Embassy of Costa Rica to the United States. In 2017, she returned to New York as part of the Costa Rican delegation to the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. In 2018, Maritza Chan went back to Washington, DC as the head of the political section at the Embassy of Costa Rica. She has a senior speechwriter for the for the president of Costa Rica and has more than 20 years of experience as a professional writer. Maritza's presentation today focuses on the nuclear ban treaty and its role for enhancing female's participation from a diplomatic discourse. Maritza, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here today. In September 2017, Costa Rica was a proud signatory on, on the treaty for nuclear weapon, for the provision of nuclear weapons. The ban treaty was without a doubt a landmark achievement in the signatory's common goal of nuclear disarmament, but equally remarkable was, was the inclusion of two gender specific elements to the treaty. The first one in the preamble recognizes the proportionate impact on women and girls, including as a result of ionizing radiation. And the second mention in Article 6 recognized the need for gender sensitive assistance without discrimination in victim assistance and environmental remediation. In its acknowledgement of the gendered dimension of nuclear weapons, the Nuclear Ban Treaty is lauded as the only gender sensitive nuclear weapons agreement in existence. This is a good thing. 
Women and girls have never had the privilege of accepting themselves from the horrors or words of the violence of weapons. But for too long, women and girls were completely absent from the negotiating table and completely absent from the finished text of our collected efforts to mitigate these words and weapons. Indeed, in many cases, the effects of these weapons are felt disproportionately larger by women, yet their voices are often, even now, left unheard in the process of finding solutions to conflict. So the Nuclear Ban Treaty represents a massive step forward, but it's not enough, not nearly enough, to pat ourselves on the back and consider gender inclusion a finished task. The substantive text of the Nuclear Ban Treaty amount to just under 4,000 words. Of these 4,000 words, only two paragraphs, or just 111 words, deal directly with women and girls. That just about adds up to 3%. Just, yes, I counted it, and yes, I did the math. Of course, we cannot make, make gender inclusion just about the numbers. But I mentioned it to, do, to draw your attention to the fact that the treaty spends significantly more time discerning how state parties will equitably share the cost of hosting meetings and conducting its business than it does making space for women and girls. If, if the nuclear ban treaty is going to be a game changer for female participation, we must take, store, take stock of where we are when it comes to the meaningful inclusion of women and girls and international peace and security. Gender remains a structural problem at the UN. The voices of women and girls have always been present, but often never truly heard. The elevation and success of some women and the inclusion of some female voices and perspectives does not remedy the fact that the voices of most women and girls remain secondary to the traditionally male-oriented narrative, politics, and power that is the foundation of the UN. Women and girls are ever-present in the theaters of world of women. We apologize for the technical problems um, and we hope to carry on very soon. Let's just wait for a few seconds and hope that Marisa's um, internet connection um, will resume. Otherwise, we would um, carry on with uh, Alicia. Okay, Marisa, you're back on. Um, we cannot hear you at the moment. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? And yes. where, where, <laughs> where was I speaking? Where did I leave? Can you hear me now? I cannot hear you. Oh, I can hear you properly. Um, you were right at the comparison, statistical comparison of the time spent um, dealing with gender inclusion as opposed to um, regular conference duties of payments and states' contributions. <laughs> okay, um, so let me go back. Um, okay. If the Nuclear Bank Treaty it's go is to be a game changer for female participation, we must take stock of where we truly are when it comes to the meaningful participation and inclusion of women and girls and international peace and security. Gender remains a structural problem at the UN. The voices of women and girls have always been present but not truly heard. The elevation of success of some women and the inclusion of some female voices and perspectives 
does not remedy the fact that the voices of most women and girls remain secondary to the traditionally male-oriented narrative of politics and power that is the foundation of the UN system. Women and girls are ever present in the theaters of world around the world as both combatants and diplomatic and NGO professionals at the UN. So why are we still having this conversation about gender inclusion? Why do women show up as less than 3% of what is universally acknowledged as a gender sensitive, sensitive, gender sensitive perspective of nuclear weapons. The gender specific elements of the nuclear ban treaty are seeds that have been planted at the resolve of the tireless labor of people who have largely existed behind the scenes, some of whom I recognize here as participants on this panel. Now it's the time to begin the work of growing these seeds of gender equity into a truly gender equitable future for the international peace and security. Now is the time to fully acknowledge the voices and the contribution of women and girls. The nuclear ban treaty show us only the beginning of how is it possible to create and write a more inclusive future. A future in which the voices of women and girls are level equally along, alongside those of men, a future in which the voices of women and girls are, are, are actually afforded the same level of respect and authority as the grand narratives of power that have traditionally informed our diplomacy. But how do we build this future from these seats? First, female women's participation and leadership. As you well know, the presidency of the 2017 UN conference was held by a Costa Rican woman. What you may not know is that the negotiating delegation sent by Costa Rica to the conference was composed entirely of women. This gender composition of the Costa Rican delegation was not by a specific design. It was by accident. But that in and of itself represents a core part of the problem. The inclusion and active participation of women needs to be by intention. In this sense, the Costa Rica delegation to the conference for the nuclear ban treaty was an anomaly. Under 25% of the delegations to the conference were headed by a woman. Just over 30% of the overall delegates to the conference were women. These numbers are not terrible and may be seen by some as a measure of success. However, research has shown that larger conferences of so more than 100 people tend to have an outsized proportion of women compared to small firms that continue to be dominated by men. Indeed, if states can send one person to a meeting, they almost always send a man, which begs the question, why is it still the case that there's only space made for women after men have taken their seat at the table? We need to do more to challenge this dark reality. Women belong at the negotiating table. Women belong in technical groups. Women belong in fieldwork and inspections. So beyond adding to our numbers, how do we really challenge at the end the structure that has incubated this problem? Second, making real space for feminist perspectives and narratives. The participants to the Conference of the Nuclear Ban Treaty did remarkable work, work within a rigid structure of existing power politics, a structure that has repeatedly treated women as token participants or treated women and girls as vulnerable victims of little consequential value. We must not underestimate the work that women did in negotiating the nuclear ban treaty or the work in writing a gender sensitive treaty task. But we cannot continue to expect women to simply walk into a spaces from which they have traditionally been excluded and expect them to start talking the language of those who have traditionally excluded their voices. Introducing more women with decent security specializations into their foreign service, it's a good start. Having more women enter with female diplomats and negotiators 
it's a step, it's another step in the right direction. But this cannot be the only concessions to the problem of gender at the UN. If we are to fully acknowledge gender as a structural problem at the UN, our mentoring efforts must be more about more than teaching a select group of quota of women how to make their way into a men's world. Yes, we must address the, not, the problem of women inclusion, but the burden of gender equity cannot fall solely on the shoulders of women who have been mentored into the old system. Mentorship must be about leading by example, showing the next generation of young women and young men that their contributions and their experience are not value only in their relation to the traditional narratives of hard power politics. In this regard, the Nuclear Ban Treaty is a monumental step forward. An undergraduate student learning about nuclear, nuclear disarmament in 2021 will see women's reproductive health written as a primary concern of nuclear disarmament. Imagine with me the impact of that inclusion in the next generation of scholars and diplomats who will continue this work when we are done. A seed has been planted indeed. Mentorship must be about more than making space for women or making sure that there are enough women at the room. It's about creating a space that is truly capable and honoring and valuing the experience and contribution of women and girls, including in meetings that are held virtually and about creating a space for alternative approaches to international peace and security. The work is not done, we'll still have the road towards the first conference of state parties, and we need to get it right, especially for female uh, participation. I thank you. Thank you so much, Maritza. Um, I think your presentation shows very, very well um, how treaties practically relate and also structurally relate um, to the participation, also to narratives um, within diplomacy, um, but also shows where, um, of course, there's, there's also work to do. Um, to the audience, please be reminded to submit your questions um, in the Q&A and um, we will ask them um, after Alicia's um, talk. Alicia Sander sacre is the Policy and Research Coordinator at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. She is the author of over 100 articles, editorials and reports on nuclear weapons, many um, on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and has provided expert analysis for news outlets, including The Guardian, Bloomberg, DW, and Newsweek. She's going to talk about the female participation of the DPNW from civil society perspective, and how the treaty challenges a patriarchal narrative on nuclear weapons. Alicia, it's your turn. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here and to speak after uh, such an insightful contribution from my fellow um, panelists. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, just give me a moment. All right. Nope, sorry. All right. So yeah, it, it's really, again, my, my pleasure to be here. Um, I'll be talking about uh, covering kind of a lot of what's been outlined um, about feminism, nuclear weapons, uh, female participation, and specifically looking at uh, the TPNW and civil society uh, contributions. So first, just a little bit about ICANN for those who, who aren't familiar with us. Um, we're a campaign of uh, over 500 partner organizations in more than 100 countries. Uh, we're headquartered in Geneva, where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, and we have the common goal of banning, stigmatizing, and eliminating nuclear weapons. Uh, we were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for our work uh, alongside many dedicated diplomats, of course, to achieve uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, and now we're really focused on promoting adherence to implementation, universalization of the treaty. 
I first want to just start out by kind of asking the question, why are we talking today about feminism and, and nuclear weapons? What's kind of the background here in terms of, uh, again, both participation and the narratives that we hear uh, about nuclear weapons. And a lot of this really ties back into the TPNW, um, but just to give a bit of a general overview. So starting out, you know, it's been about uh, a decade and we've had a number of UN uh, resolutions addressing uh, different aspects of uh, women and disarmament. Um, and, you know, first of course, with the landmark UN Security Council Resolution 1325, uh, which really tied gender into all aspects of security action, Security Council action, um, including, of course, disarmament. Uh, in 2010, there was another UN Security Council resolution looking at women, disarmament, uh, arms control, and nonproliferation. Uh, and then a UN General Assembly resolution in uh, 2012 as well. And so all of this kind of preceded, uh, of course, the TPNW and and uh, kind of built up some of this discussion and narrative within the UN. One, you know, a, a kind of clear link uh, in terms of why do we talk about, why do we need to talk about women and, uh, and feminism when we talk about nuclear weapons is looking at uh, the impact of, of nuclear weapons. Uh, and there's a clear uh, disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls. Uh, and there's a number of examples um, I'm sorry, this is a bit text heavy, um, but just so you kind of have a lot of information here, um, there's been, you know, really a lot of research looking into uh, the, the disproportionate um, impact of ionizing radiation on women and girls uh, who are more likely to uh, develop cancer uh, and other diseases due to, to exposure. Um, and that, that, that comes from you know, studies from Hiroshima Nagasaki, as well as uh, Chernobyl. Um, there's the impacts that pregnant women uh, face from nuclear radiation uh, and uh, the, the impacts on, on their children. Um, and you know, what's really, I think, uh, even more compelling uh, and concerning about this impact is that there's also been research looking at um, how uh, kind of we, we understand the impact of radiation and that the model for understanding the impact of radiation on humans is often a man. Um, and that really uh, then leads to a misunderstood uh, impact on, on women kind of as a whole overall. And uh, I put in brackets, Mary Olson has, has written a lot about that. Um, as I'll just kind of touch on this briefly because because it's it's already been mentioned, um, but there's consistent underrepresentation of women, despite in some ways their kind of uh, unique contribution to these discussions on nuclear weapons uh, in in diplomatic fora, and this is really across the board. Um, and there's been a lot of research on this as well that I can I'm happy to to share more. Uh, in addition to of course the experiences that that uh, really any diplomats or civil society from who've been in the UN can, can share. Um, and I think this, this really gets to, uh, I think the heart of the issue that's beyond, um, you know, it really speaks to why we have to talk about more than just, uh, just representation of women as important as that is uh, when we talk about feminism and nuclear weapons. Um, is really this uh, at the heart of, of nuclear weapons and, and security, international security discourse more broadly, um, is this uh, really uh, skewed perspective of, you know, what's uh, rational and, and strong um, and what, what security is uh, that, that, you know, values uh, weapons and, and devalues cooperative human security approach. Um, really to, to the detriment of, of global security, peace and security. Um, I just put one kind of historical example um, of how this, this approach can really threaten uh, initiatives to pursue disarmament, to pursue common security. Um, this is a historical example, um, but of course we hear kind of tripes like this all the time about people who want to pursue disarmament 
uh, you know, I know, I think every, every woman certainly and, and, and most people who are working and pursuing disarmament uh, might have been told they're, they're not serious or they're emotional. Um, I think uh, Ray Atchison spoke about this in, in the previous uh, panel in the series, but there's really uh, no shortage of, of examples here. And uh, I think it's really important to tackle this perspective um, head on uh, if we really need, need to make progress on disarmament. So that kind of brings me to the TPNW. Um, and I, you know, I certainly agree with what um, my previous, uh, previous panelists mentioned about the fact that the TPNW is certainly a step forward, but it's not the be all end all solution. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so I do wanna emphasize that while also pulling out a little bit of what um, you know, we tried to do differently on the TPNW when it came to uh, how you know, nuclear weapons and gender and uh, participation. So I will just go through this. So first, I mean, I, I think that looking at the civil society angle there, it really is a long, incredibly inspiring history of uh, women from around the world um, and particularly women from uh, indigenous and impacted communities who've spoken out about the impact of nuclear weapons. Um, this is not a new thing uh, and it's really you know, one thing that's very empowering to be a part of the ICANN movement is to continue to kind of uh, build on this long history of, of women who have uh, spoken about the need to, to disarm and, and really brought a human perspective uh, to, these, uh, to these issues. So I've just put a few pictures here. One is a compilation of um, women from the Pacific who spoke out about, um, you know, their experience and activism uh, with nuclear weapons testing um, and, and efforts for nuclear free uh, Pacific. This is um, the portrait of three different uh, Hibakusha women who survived uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings who have become really leading activists uh, in the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, and then here, this is um, a picture of Helen Caldicott, who uh, founded Physicians for Social Responsibility in the US and was really known for delivering these very powerful, uh, very human speeches about what would actually happen uh, medically when a nuclear weapon is dropped uh, in terms of, you know, in, in kind of graphic details, um, what these weapons actually do, pulling back this uh, curtain of, you know, security deterrence to really, to really give you the truth about nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think this is something that, that all of these women have done and, and speaks to linking, um, not just, you know, why female participation is important, but also the importance of, of new perspectives uh, and human perspectives. So, you know, this, we certainly saw the continuation of uh, female leadership in civil society in the movement uh, to ban uh, nuclear weapons and get the TPNW. Um, so here, this is just a photo of um, several ICANN campaigners um, outside the United Nations in New York. And then we have uh, Beatrice Finn and Setsuko Thurlow accepting uh, the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of ICANN uh, after getting the treaty. And so again, I think um, following on this, this legacy of female participation, elevating the humanitarian perspective, that was really core uh, to achieving the TPNW. Um, in, as was mentioned in, in the introduction, um, the series of humanitarian conf conferences that preceded um, the, the TPNW and uh, of course, within the treaty itself. So this was also mentioned already, but I just wanted to, to have a chance to show you um, what we saw in terms of impact uh, of this process of really uh, featuring female perspectives and, and, um, and the humanitarian uh, kind of element of security. Uh, and in the preamble, of course, we have uh, the references that were mentioned already, uh, really groundbreaking in terms of, of international law on nuclear weapons. Uh, I, think, I think this is a good example of what how the process can really change the product. 
And then of course, uh, with Article 6, again, um, on providing uh, assistance for victims of nuclear weapons use and testing and remediating uh, contaminated environments, which at, at its core is, you know, centering again, uh, the survivor, the human experience, uh, the human impact of nuclear weapons, and of course, picking up um, the importance of gender sensitive assistance. So, you know, to conclude, I think um, I, I, I agree that we've seen that, you know, there's still a huge problem in terms of the dominant narrative on nuclear weapons and uh, the, the TPNW hasn't magically changed that, um, but it does provide a really important new and fresh perspective um, on uh, feminism and nuclear weapons uh, and human security. And joining the TPNW really represents uh, an important step forward um, in terms of recognizing the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons uh, and you know, the, the leadership of female survivors uh, from around the world uh, on, on nuclear disarmament. Um, and it's an important step for, for all countries to take. I think, again, going forward, uh, certainly we need to continue to work to ensure there is strong female participation uh, and, and not just, um, you know, not just women from the global north, but really uh, representative uh, female participation uh, within the, the next uh, meetings of the treaty as it, as it advances and goes forward. Um, and that, that continues. I think it's, it will be an ongoing uh, effort and we can't, we can't forget about it. Um, and then just to, just to also conclude that again, we see the TPNW as really a revolutionary step forward, um, but there are also many other kind of existing international fora where uh, disarmament and, and nuclear weapons uh, are, are discussed. And so it's important to bring this approach, um, a feminist approach to all relevant uh, international fora. So with that, I look forward to, to taking more questions. Thank you so much, Alicia. Uh, thank you. It's really amazing to hear this great insights on the TPNW. And thank you for your contribution and for shedding particular light on the role of civil society in leading the treaty to further accomplishments. So we will now request the audience to add some questions through the Q&A function. We will have two initial questions and then we'll proceed to the Q&A afterwards. We would like to start uh, with Maritza. So Maritza, by mentioning the idea that, that, were, that there might be strong participation of women, however, the challenge is how to make sure that their voices have been heard. So how do you think the TPNW could help in addressing this particular challenge? I think that we can do that now by setting the right foundations and structures towards the first conference state parties to ensure that the mandates uh, that are enshrined in the, in, the, in the text of the treaty are upheld and respected and honored by the state parties and by those who may, may join afterwards. Um, I don't think that the job is done. Uh, we have a long way to go. We have one year towards the first conference state parties and there is where we can ensure that we honor the treaty text and the promises that uh, were written in it. Thank you so much, Maritza. Um, <clears throat> next question from our side is for Alicia. Um, Alicia, we spoke about feminism, um, but um, I want to ask a more concrete question. How important do you think is an intersectional understanding of feminism for the TPNW, um, especially also considering the role of uh, post-colonial perspectives? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's absolutely critical. Uh, and we've seen, I mean, I, I spoke about the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls. But we've also seen certainly the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on indigenous people and peoples of color um, due to uh, where nuclear weapons were tested and, uh, and even where they were dropped. And I think that that is such a, a critical, um, 
perspective uh, and those who have direct experiences with the impact of nuclear weapons are the real experts of nuclear weapons and who should be uh, centered in, in conversations about uh, disarmament and, and about these weapons. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, about having a representative um, perspectives that, that are not, uh, you know, concentrated in one gender or one region of the world uh, or one race, um, but that are, are really reflective of the global community and uh, the global security that we need. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, also, interesting questions are coming up in the chat. So I'm going to take the first one, the first one addressed to Maritza. Why do you think that the percentage of texts about women and girls is that low? And where so many passages cut or where they never drafted in the first place? Because it's always a struggle to include gender text in treaties. And I saw that during the negotiations of the Amstrad Treaty, when it was a fight between states to include gender-based violence as a consequence of the illicit uh, transfer of weapons to certain countries. It's always a battle. Uh, it's not something that negotiating, uh, that is not in the mindsets of people with security backgrounds. Um, having a human security approach to weapons, it's something that this treaty does, but it's just the beginning. Um, it's very hard when you have um, people with different mindsets of what security means, and that translates to treaty text. That would be my answer. Thank you so much. Um, the next one is uh, by Anna for Alicia. Um, Alicia, what thoughts do you have regarding some global powers, for example, the Biden administration um, and the discourse on nuclear weapons and uh, gender inclusivity um, in this regard and in these um, global powers and administrations? Sure. I mean, uh, I think I, I've, I've spoken a little bit about the, the dominant uh, discourse on nuclear weapons and what's problematic about it from a feminist perspective. Uh, and this relates certainly to uh, how the United States uh, thinks and, and speaks about nuclear weapons uh, in that, uh, you know, claiming that nuclear weapons can provide or do provide security uh, for the United States really overlooks um, the who nuclear weapons do not provide security for. Uh, and that's you know, people within the United States who live near nuclear weapons laboratories uh, that are still contaminated um, from nuclear weapons production or near former test sites uh, who are suffering from the impacts of a nuclear weapons test decades ago um, you know, the downwinders in the United States as well, who are uh, still uh, suffering uh, really tragic uh, rates of cancer um, in, their, in their communities due to the impacts of nuclear weapons testing. Um, I think it's, it's just this, this conceptualization of security that ignores um, the most impacted uh, within a country and within the global community uh, that's really problematic and is really why we need to, to approach the nuclear weapons conversation and disarmament discourse uh, with a feminist uh, perspective, with a common uh, and human security lens uh, to truly understand what actually does pro provide security for any given country and, and for the international community. Yeah, um, thank you, Alicia. And I think it's crucial to think about the risks in order to move from like the security understanding and moving from um, state centric approach to human centering approach and to see what are the risks of these um, nuclear weapons. Um, thank you for these insights. And the next question is um, to Maritza. Could you expand on? women and meaningful participation 
in diplomacy and uh, UN deliberations, so as opposed to having women merely for the numbers, and how to enhance their participation. How can male counterparts contribute to ensuring that women take leading roles in diplomacy? Um, personally, I believe that sometimes the feminist discourse have been um, held by a group of countries from the global north. And their, their work has led the way for many of us from the global south to replicate the, those voices. But the feminist agenda does not belong to a regional group. It belongs to all of us. And as I've read the work of one of the participants in this panel, I love the perception of the notion of being part of the resistance. And as a woman, you are born at, as part of the resistance. As a diplomat from the global south, I'm also part of the resistance. As a country does not have nuclear weapons and that values its, its security and interprets insecurity in terms of human security and invests more of its GDP in education and health than many of, of our neighboring countries, um, we try to convey that into uh, what we understand of as the feminist approach and also the participation of women. And that means creating alliances, working with other female uh, diplomats from the global south and making sure that we support each other on the negotiating uh, table, that we are support each other vocally when we are negotiating treaty texts or resolutions, and that we create a front in which uh, we are able to um, have our own say because there is no exclusivity in, 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 in this fight. Uh, it's our fight. It's, it's, uh, it's something that women from the North and the South have to do together. So um, creating alliances, working with other delegations, um, that's key. And sometimes when it comes to the male counterparts, sometimes they do recognize your contribution and they step aside or say, this is the person who's leading with that process. And sometimes it doesn't. Um, what you can do is vesting. And I think that the, my best advice to anyone, and particularly for women, if you work with excellence, if your work is pristine, if you show up early and leave, you know, and, and you do your job well. Um, it's undeniable that you will be called to the negotiating table, that you will call for a delegation because you have done your job. Um, and also, you know, having someone that recognize that, that there's value added in bringing you to a group or a delegation, but it means also working in cooperation and not in competition. Um, next we have Thank you, Maritza. Next, we have a very, very um, a connected question, I guess, from Mehdia. Um, I'd like to give to um, Alicia. So, Alicia, what are some of the specific um, challenges you have um, as a woman in um, civil society diplomacy in um, all the disarmament forums? And um, what are the things um, you suggest one can do when you're in a space where there are male individuals who inhibit your chance to speak or may make it difficult for you to fully participate. And Maritza, if you want to add something as well after um, that, feel free. Yeah, so I mean, I guess speaking from, from personal experience, um, I think in, in many ways I've been very lucky uh, that uh, in, in every uh, organization that I've worked, I've had really uh, excellent female colleagues and and mentors and supervisors um, who have really uh, acted as uh, you know real real helpers to me in terms of elevating um, my my own opportunities and 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 experiences. Um, so I think that you know certainly just speaking from a personal perspective, it's it is really helpful to be able to find kind of a female 
a mentor who you can kind of ask questions and who can who can help um, push you forward in a way. Um, but I, I think it's it's also um, partly about uh, kind of recognizing your own uh, your own intelligence and value and uh, contribution to the to the conversation. Um, and uh, you know, I think there's there can be a number of, of factors, um, but uh, sometimes it can be a bit intimidating to want to to contribute or to speak speak up and. Um, uh, I'd say, you know, do, do what you can to try to do that. Um, but I think, yeah, outside of that, certainly finding a, a mentor can be very useful. Um, but, but I would say I, I haven't, uh, I've been very lucky to, to, to be surrounded by, as I mentioned in civil society, um, disarmament civil society, there are a lot of really, really um, strong female leaders. So I've been very lucky to, to be surrounded by them for most of my career. Thank you, Alicia, really great tips to encourage women to participate um, in such um, like environment. And then we move to a more practical or like particular uh, question to Maritza. What are some concrete steps that states can take to address the structural inequality at the UN? At the same time, what are some concrete steps that the UN can take to address and resolve such representation issue? Um, there is, there are several studies on the cascade effect, which means that members of the permanent members of the Security Council have an advantage in appointing um, their people to senior level positions at the UN. Um, it shouldn't be like that. It should be by merit. It should be an open and transparent process to find the best person for a job. Uh, so that's one of the structural problems that we face. Um, and it's one of the proposals that Costa Rica has for the election of the secretary general or the process of selection of the next secretary general that this practice must change, that we need to ensure that the best people for the job um, are appointed. He has, um, the current secretary general has made the case for gender balance in senior posts, and I welcome that approach, but there's still certain positions that are just kept for the P5. So that's a structural problem at the United Nations. How can you break that? Um, it takes time. Um, raising the issue is one step. Uh, including it in, in the discussions of the processes like the revitalization of the General Assembly on whenever we have an open debate at the Security Council um, on the working methods, or you know, if the chance comes, we address it. Um, but it's it's. It's a long way to go because the structures are there and you need to be really, really smart and have to navigate those waters. But I think that you can do it respectfully and, and sometimes, someday they might listen. Thank you. I think it's, it's um, a really good step to um, speak out about that um, as you did now um, very openly. Um, about what goes wrong in the end. And I think that hopefully is the first step to um, real change. Um, we want to proceed with uh, Elizabeth's uh, question. Um, she thanks you for the enlightening presentations. And um, she, she says that um, she would love to hear from you both. Um, in your experience over the past years, um, has the shift of many forums and conferences from in-person to online um, both within the UN and in other institutions helped or hindered women's participation and the effort to make their voices heard and of course meant in the past year and in the past years. Um, so yeah, what has COVID to do with all of that? Um, Alicia, um, do you want to start and then Maritza? Sure, yeah, I can kind of speak from the civil society uh, perspective in that I think there has been a lot of concerns about 
uh, ensuring active um, and meaningful civil society participation in online uh, fora. And, uh, you know, I think you do lose something um, when you're not all in the, in the physical same place together in terms of dialogues and exchanges that might happen uh, more informally uh, on a normal basis um, that can be a bit more difficult to, to maintain in an online setting. Um, so I, I don't know that it's specific to women, um, but you know, perhaps given there is a lot of uh, female leadership in civil society on weapons and, and nuclear disarmament issues, um, I think it is something that we're certainly monitoring uh, and and want to ensure that there is um, you know full and effective participation of women and civil society uh, when it comes to future TPNW meetings, which hopefully. Um, will not be online. But uh, yeah, it's certainly, I think, been something to, to monitor and be aware of. In, in our, I think it has improved because there are no costs associated with women traveling um, to, conf oh, to meetings or conferences. And even at the Security Council, sometimes you hear their voices. I hope to see that in the next commemoration of the, of the Women International Day on March 8th, um, and to hear the voices from women from the global south or Africa or Syria that haven't been affected by conflict. Um, in a way, it has improved because the costs associated with traveling, with, with having bringing one woman or another to a meeting, um, decreased, but um, it also about it's about connectivity. Are all these women able to connect to the internet? Are they networked? Um, are they part of a, rose, a a list of experts or or people that you will call uh, for information or insights? Um, and that's something that we lost with the with the pandemic. Yeah, in-person meetings continue to be key and important to develop these relationships that you need when we are working towards um, like-minded states or civil society and, and together um, as one voice towards uh, an end goal. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, more efforts is needed to um, just face the challenges um, that we are facing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'll move to the next question. Um, how do you envision the discourse and narrative on international security and disarmament along with the, um, the patriarchal understanding of it, the change with successful gender inclusivity? So Alicia and then Maritza, if you can add anything on after Alicia, you're welcome. Sure. I mean, I think this this is really uh, one reason why the effective and equal participation of uh, women and, and women from around the world um, is is so important. Um, is is to really uh, have a, an accurate. Um, dialogue, a representative dialogue on these issues and to change kind of the, the conceptualization of, of nuclear weapons uh, and security to one that's very, um, you know, defined in a, a patriarchal kind of hard security uh, way to, to more of this, as we've discussed, um, collective human security um, framework. And um, I think that certainly the participation of, of women of impacted communities um, is, is so important to, to bring about that change in discourse. Um, but of course, it's not really the, the only thing. Um, there's also uh, a lot of need for um, and uh, has been, you know, a lot of kind of research uh, on this these problems um, and uh, criticizing kind of the, the dominant security uh, framework that, that helps to, to shape and change perspectives um, as well as certainly uh, activism to really get the message out there beyond uh, diplomatic 
forum. Um, so I think certainly the, the, this is you know one reason why the participation of women is so important is to to bring a, a new perspective and to change kind of this problematic uh, thinking about nuclear weapons. But uh, we also need more than just that to to change to change this this discourse. I see it in two levels. First, there's an obstacle and is the pandemic, which means that most resolutions will be uh, technically updated. So there will be no discussion or inclusion of new paragraphs or proposals on, on, on the issue. Nevertheless, there's an advantage and is that's the role of civil society uh, and, and tools like reaching critical will of the ICANN um, um, newsletters or publications and certain issues that are key to educating us, the states, on what is um, the important angles. Uh, and, and we, members, and I, I can tell you this, member states read what you publish, member states appreciate the angle, and that creates, and, and they listen. So there is an advantage right here, right now to educate, um, convey the main points and, and issues that need to be raised once we are able to negotiate and introduce text to resolutions that need, that need more than a technical rollover. Um, the text of certain resolutions must be strengthened. Um, and you can only do that if you have the time to identify those resolutions and to work coordinated with a group of countries that will push for those uh, inclusions and defend it when the time comes. But you can only do that if you work together with other states, ideally uh, within different regions. So it doesn't sound like something from just a geographical group, but it will come a global concern. Thank you so much. And um, I think it's really important also um, to stress this, um, yeah, working together of uh, diplomacy and um, civil society. And I think this um, dialogue is a very good example um, of this. So we're, going towards the end of this really interesting um, discussion. So I um, would just like to um, have one last question for you both um, before we um, wrap this discussion up. Um, and uh, yeah, let me, let me ask the question for both of you. Um, in order to face this strong opposition by dominant male and power narratives in the field of disarmament, um, we need a collective partnership of civil society and diplomatic actors. I think that's something um, we just spoke about as well. Um, what do you think are the main strategies to achieve either cooperation, achieve a deeper cooperation, and um, how does the TPNW um, contribute to it and is also a symbol um, of this cooperation? Um, whoever wants to start um, may start. I, I can start. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think this uh, the TPNW has been a really, really great example of cooperation um, between civil society and states, and uh, it's been, you know, a real uh, joy and, and privilege to work so closely uh, with so many dedicated diplomats um, on the treaty. Uh, and uh, you know, this is something that I think will certainly continue uh, and has continued. Uh, past the negotiation of the treaty and, and into its, its implementation. Um, ICANN works uh, very closely with, with all states parties on, for example, ensuring that, that all states had uh, submitted their declarations, which is a, an obligation under Article 2 of the treaty, um, and you know, putting forward recommendations for how states can uh, implement obligations on um, you know, universalizing the treaty, for example, um, and thinking about uh, implementing the the positive obligations as well. Um, and it's it's very much a, I'd say a, a close partnership. Um, and I think in order to make that happen, a lot of it is really about uh, relationship building. 
And this is something that I really, I really noticed when I came in, came into ICANN was really the importance on um, the kind of social aspects of, of relationships and, and understanding that, you know, we're all people too, and it's important to, to get to know each other and to support each other and to work together um, beyond just, you know, negotiating any given article or, or implementing a given article. Um, so I think it's, it's really taking a, a relation, uh, relational relationship kind of um, approach to, uh, to working relationships is, is so critical to, to have effective cooperation. I think that we should continue to work as partners. Uh, civil society has done a great job raising the level of ambition and you must continue to do that. And, and as, a, as a state, I, I urge you to continue asking states to raise the level of ambition because civil society is there to push us to do better, to be fairer, to be more inclusive. And I thank you for that. Also, you have civil society organizations play a major role in, in educating experts. And it's something that we truly need now on the road towards the next, uh, to the first conference state parties. There's a new group of experts in New York, Geneva and Austria that were not part of the negotiations. It's actually an anomaly that some of us are back most of them have rotated or going to different posts. So we need to raise the knowledge level of the experts. So we have substantive, ambitious, creative uh, ways to set the structure for the next conference state parties. And this is the job that we need to do now. Great inspirations. Thank you so much. and. Um... Yeah, cooperation is needed more than ever today to face and to reject the dominant narrative. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to respond to all of the, of the questions, but we will answer them in the subsequent report after the webinar. We came to the end of our webinar. However, it's not the end of our discussion on feminist leadership in disarmament. Um, this was the webinar two of out of seven. And our next webinar of the series is on patriarchal structures in disarmament in two weeks. I invite everyone to join the next webinar and you can find more information um, and the link to register uh, on our website and social media. Many thanks to our amazing speakers, Maritza Chan and Alisa sanders Sacre, and to everyone who has joined us. Um, I hope you found it thoughtful and interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you.